Well, good afternoon. Uh, well, it's good evening, isn't it, ladies and gentlemen? And welcome to what is an additional Nature Folklore Sessions on this Wednesday, 6th of October, 2021. And I didn't have time to do an opening video, so I'll just have to continue. And uh, thank you for joining me. This, I must admit, this evening is our first evening extra. Uh, I was having trouble with the green screen, so forgive me if there's a shadow, and I'm not even sure which position I'm supposed to be sat in. So <laughs> uh, thank you for uh, being here. We are live. Um, uh, there's some people around, which is fantastic. Uh, do forgive me tonight. It's going to be a bit of amateur hour, and uh, I'm not as prepared as I am uh, on the Sundays, so this is different. But on Sunday, just couldn't complete uh, the... Uh, which is Cauldron and Ales. So it's ended up being a three-part series because it's not going to be completed today or this evening. So I'm going to be back next Wednesday evening because I'd like to do the dragons and uh, the fire dragons and serpents So uh, is on Sunday. So again, thank you for joining me here. Uh, a different time, time for exploring Nature Center folklore, connecting this uh, within your favorite sanctuary space and certainly... This is a subject to ponder on. And expressing all your inspired visions from your sanctuary through your poetry, writing, art, craft, performance, and problem solving. So this evening, it was Hubble Bubble Witches and Ale on Sunday, but now uh, it's different. It's Witches, Cauldrons, and Ale uh, Part 2. And uh, as I say, I couldn't uh, finish it last Sunday. And uh, this one's actually part two, I'm calling it, which is Cauldron and Nail Medieval Moments. And that's as far as I can actually get. Computers are already playing up. Uh, I didn't get set up. So excuse me a second while I, I get rid of the rubbish. Anyway, I'm going to recap uh, part one, which was the origins the, of the Ale Housewives. And I will explore how they became known as witches. Uh, I'll probably get to that by the end of this evening's session. But before I explain more, just to say uh, these sessions, uh, the nature folklore sessions, and still the Carol Crory Labyrinth Gardens, despite the news that's being put about, is all helped by your wonderful subscriptions. And thank you very much, uh, subscribers may be watching. But we're a different time, uh, Wednesday evening. It might be a totally different audience. I'll find out in a minute. Uh, so it's brought by the subscribers. If it wasn't for you subscribers, I wouldn't be able to go on the air because of the monthly subscription. So thank you very much for watching live today and your uh, continued support. And this is what's keeping it going. So uh, let's see. We've got quite a few people joining us, uh, making comments. Uh, let's see who's uh, with us for now before I try and get going here. Uh, Little Wings back uh, via the YouTube. Lovely to see you from Manchester. Uh, lovely regular Elizabeth uh, Flynn there from Downing Wexford. Lovely. And uh, there's someone else here that I'm trying to get up who's not coming up. Uh, there you go. Terry Stack Hardwick. Uh, good, all, good afternoon. It's afternoon in Maryland, USA. Elise uh, Giru is here. Uh, forgive me if I'm not pronouncing you right yet. Uh, Mark Oxbrow here. I, John, made it from Australia. That's different because we don't usually get Australian people on Sunday. And uh, uh, Little Wing enjoyed part one, so that's great. A uh, whole new meaning of brewing. And I think I'll expand on that because I'm going to verge, get on the verge of the witchery side of this, particularly with a Kilkenny tale in Ireland. I think you'll enjoy that. Let's put towards the end. Yeah, and uh, Liz was saying damp evening. Yeah, it's pouring here. Uh, so great to settle down to enjoy this. So thank you, everyone, for being here. And I'm going to try and get going uh, with this and see how far we can get today. Uh, so on Sunday, I did ask, uh, did you know that uh, beer and ale is the third most consumed beverage in the world after water? And tea, and, that, and that's the picture I showed, a uh, picture of ale, just in case you don't know what it is. And certainly beer and ale has been the essential part of the human diet for at least 7,000 years and possibly up to 10,000 years. So I hope you're seeing this uh, clear, everyone, and that I'm, the microphone's 
coming through to you loud and clear. So this entire history of brewing uh, from deep ancient times, maybe 10,000 BC, has really been about the history of women. And again, I must brag this one, of course, because uh, there is a, an ancestor of mine, Joan Wilmint there. Uh, so there we go. And uh, it's certainly uh, much more about the women than it is about the test drawn shooting matches from the redneck men. And I showed that one on Sunday, the redneck men there. There we go. Am I back with you? Hello there. Am I back? Sorry about this. It's a glitch galore this evening. As I was saying, I got all kinds of stuff coming up on the screen that shouldn't be. So please let me know uh, if this is working for you. Um, I'm going to post a comment. Uh, um, now, can you see and hear me? Hello again, am I back? Yes, okay, I can continue. Sorry about that interlude. Anyway, back to uh, the story, and uh, that, thanks very much. Uh, there might be a bit of that this evening, so I do apologize if this happens again. There's all kinds of stuff coming. I, I work on three screens, and the stuff coming up on all the screens uh, that shouldn't be. So I'm trying to sort of jump around them. Anyway, during the second part uh, of this, I am to illustrate better about what became what we know as witchery and how it was seeded. And it was by these remarkable ancient ale brewing women. And uh, there's some ale brewing women, uh, ancient. That's a Persian uh, depiction, I think. And I'm going to start by discussing how the men gilded together, and they spread this viral belief of the existence of witchery. Well, now, this was late medieval time. But I also intend to demonstrate and inspire how women knew how to work around this. Now, most of that's going to be in part three now, but I'll try and end on a nice note uh, today. But to create much uh, better days for these women, uh, the medieval times for a while wasn't too bad, but I'll give the recap, a bit more recap of what I did on Sunday. So the archaeological studies of women and brewing um, showed uh, the alehouse women. And archaeologists did find uh, evidence, and uh, this was the evidence I'm showing. And that was a story uh, way back uh, from, oh, uh, I think 2000 BC, Iran, uh, that was a poem that was done. No, I think it was a lot further than that. Was it 2000? No, I think it was 7,000 BC, because this is the second oldest scribed 
piece of work that was ever found. The oldest being in the pyramids area of Egypt. Anyway, there was a poem in this, and when it was translated, it's mentioned alehouse woman, but it was a side thing of this. Uh, alehouse wife it actually translated to. So that's an early Persian description. And uh, so I've been trying to fragment pieces together to decide or to discover what an alehouse wife was because there's a load of stories I've been telling and I suddenly realized the L housewife was actually uh, a side piece and I wasn't taking much notice I've really pulled together quite a lot of stories I've learned since I was six years old and taken all the L housewife bits that I remember and this is what I'm putting together over this three parts anyway this ale housewife it was a tradition that spread through the clannish tribes and nations for thousands of years, it came west. It skirted around the patriarchal uh, Roman Empire because that wasn't much good for them. But when it got into the Norse, the Saxon, Angles, Jutes, Danes, Vikings, and other Norse people, the men regarded these alehouse women like goddesses. They were goddesses to them. They didn't compete uh, to try and take over their... Uh, I'm trying to find some pictures of uh, this. Uh, I'm kind of messed up on this one. Sorry. Right. I mess. I haven't got. I can't find the picture on that. Anyway, these the owl house wife. Who is she? And what did she do? We'll bring you up that picture. That's that'll give you some owl house wife. What did she do? And why do we refer to her as being an owl house wife? Now, through this owl house wife tradition, it unfortunately entered into a very dark history. And I showed that one before, and we'll talk about that uh, more next week. Uh, it won't go away. Anyway, let's set the scene again. I'm going to try again. I have a bit of a drink here. Now, for thousands of years among human existence, there was always that huge, unfillable demand for alcoholic beverages. And uh, do I have uh, alcoholic beverages there we go. There's a great demand there. Look at the way that man's drinking up his uh, the ale there. Uh, although ale in the early days was very much, it was a medical, it was a nutrition purpose. It wasn't really for the merriment and uh, joyfulness and leaping around, acting the maggot, that type of stuff. It was actually made because of water. Uh, during, when people settled down to be farmers, the water runoff was in the water so there was problems with water and this was a guarantee to have something to drink uh, that was safe that was it so it was medical and there were very it wasn't all hops there were leaves there were herbal combinations and i'm going to talk more about that one i think uh, uh, next wednesday anyway uh the making trade and supply of alcoholic drinks it was by women and their customers were generally men and that one as i showed before He's sort of hiding there. So this evening, I'm going to get more local, uh, more dealing with uh, this uh, trend, this tradition in Ireland, and some of what is now the UK, also a bit of Europe and Eastern Europe as well. So uh, uh, let's see if you've been saying much uh, whilst I was rambling on with that uh, entrance. Thanks, Mark, for telling me we're, yeah, I'm back on. Little wing, all good. So we're back working. So I trust I'm still with you at the moment, um, uh, which is great news that I am. So through uh, what is the UK now, the old housewife's tradition, it seemed to have come over with the Angles, the Saxons, and Jute traditions. And I don't have any pictures of them. Um, and I did explain why, if you go back uh, on the Sunday there, uh, of uh, why that happened. And I've still got all kinds of images jumping around the screen. That's a shame. Anyway, I'm going to include how brewing is part of the legends and mythology uh, in Ireland as well. And I think the earliest one we know about, and I mentioned this on Sunday, uh, is uh, the beer goddess. Um, well, there we go. Bridget. Uh, that, I'm not sure if that's a Viking imagery or Bridget. It's got the Triscoll there, so we assume Bridget. And I mentioned that there she is. Well, she was there uh, in Kildare and I often wondered if the flame there should actually be a, a mug of ale. Uh, but other stories I've all heard also uh, uh, kind of talk about 
um, the presence of a form of uh, ale housewife during the Bronze Age earlier, even the Iron Age, and certainly came uh, over with the Tour de Danum because there's tradition on both sides of the Danube. So I think that brought them in. But the ale wives in Saxon times, uh, there's some Saxon ale wives there. Uh, I've got to look here with another reference here because I've got, uh, I'm all over the place here. Uh, they, um, Distribution of alcoholic beverages, it was certainly a sound alternative to slavery. And uh, there they go, the housewives uh, were certainly, and maybe the daughters were very popular there. And that's what we're going to focus on for the rest of this session this evening. And the Saxon influence most likely arrived in Ireland from the women, some women that were captured by Irish slave traders. Uh, the Vikings were slave traders. They came over to the shores around Ireland. And it seems like some of the Irish thought, well, they've got boats. Oh, this is a great idea. So I think it's a combination of the Vikings and some of the established uh, Aryu people went over to the UK, went over to the coasts, and uh, they tried to raid Britain. I think I've got a bit of a map here somewhere. If I can get to the picture lines, I can catch up in a minute. Uh, I would hope. Uh, no, no. Ah, uh, oh dear. I had uh, I had some lovely um, maps lined up for some reason. Uh, oops. Oh, I hope with uh, ah, there we go. There's the there's the places where the Saxons came in. If you can actually see that, and and it was around that coastline that uh, the slave traders grabbed. Uh, some people, especially the women, but those women escape that slavery uh, to actually become alehouse women. So from these women, um, the Irish born, the ch children must surely have learned the alehouse wives craft as well. Uh, again, uh, can you explain the picture that keeps popping up? The one with the ladies in the stocks. That's, I'm actually, uh, I was hoping for time with that. That's really uh, after medieval times, the Puritan times. And I'm going to bring that up on part three, which is going to be next Wednesday. I might get uh, time to talk a little bit about that towards the end of this uh, session. But continuing the old housewife tradition, it, it seemed to be present on what is Ireland and, U and also UK now. During the medieval times, and medieval times starting, Fifth century. So this evening I'm talking about fifth century going up to the 15th century because it was like a thousand years roughly of medieval times. And there was incredible transitions in, during that time, uh, especially with the old housewives, the traditions as far as education changed. Fifth century was when the gospels were just coming in. Patrick, Bridget, uh, sixth century, we've got Colin Keel. And uh, the scribing industry was just starting. It was uh, it, it, the scribing at the fifth, six, uh, fourth, fifth, sixth century was a bit like when Apple II came out, and when we think of digital now. And uh, so at that time, it was those sort of early beginnings. Then, when we had the dot com boom in the 90s, if you go back to the scriptoriums, that was pretty much like when they were settled in uh, scribes and scriptoriums, they worked out actually how to distribute and how to educate. This was, by this time, it was 7th century. And then, of course, what well, we're familiar with, the social media, uh, in the equivalent of scribing, that really started off in, like, 9th century. And uh, uh, then the, there was a whole different thing that happened after the 12th century, and that's what I'm going to get to this evening. So the old house women, they set themselves up in the 5th century. It was very simple. Uh, they really kind of established themselves, and I got a picture, some sort of picture, and this, this was what an ale house was then. Uh, I don't know I got the thank you for watching up. <laughs> um, but that was the sort of thing they would be living in. That would be the kind of ale house that they had, 5th century, 6th century even, uh, covered with hides. Maybe it was thatch, uh, reeds. And during the pre-medieval days, these huts, were probably like large sweat houses you saw made with those wicker roundhouse frames. 
uh, usually framed with hazel sticks, covered with hides, barley straw, thatch, even turf, is whatever was around, whatever they could gather. And eventually uh, clay, sand, straw coped uh, walls, they were likely to have been uh, added. And that made the hut stronger, durable. Maybe they rebuilt them to make them larger and start having visitors around. But that's how the alehouse people started. And the Bruin huts would have been positioned beside sacred spring wells. They needed the water. So where were they going to get the water? Spring wells, the holy wells, very much the domain of the alehouse women. Um, because no water, no brewing. And of course, the holy wells, as you're familiar with, are healing wells. And they have these minerals and all these wonderful additives. That gets into the brew. That's the ale. And that's why I started off really as a health drink, especially uh, here. So the old house women, their brewing and their water needs surely conjured up the folklore of the wise women keepers uh, that uh, served this, uh, served the ancient people at that time, the Saxon people especially, even before Tour de Dan and et cetera, with their mixes, their potions, their tonics, and they might be mixed up in these bollen stones. Have you been to Holy Wells and you see this sort of thing? There's a bollen stone. That one that is not existing anymore. That's by Lazi as well outside Kiju. Growing. And unfortunately, the local people thought it was untidy and they ripped it up and they put it on a pedestal. And uh, there's actually a culvert there because they thought it was unsafe for people. It's a real shame. That, uh, that happened uh, in Roundstone, or is it Roundwood in Wicklow? They did the same thing there. But that's how it's supposed to be. There's running water of the stream from the well going beside there. And I got some more pictures. This is the one that attracts as well, uh, Monaster Aiden. Uh, to me, it looks like a dragon. And you see the hole there for the Bollon Stone. You see the well uh, there. And that attractors, they've actually cemented in the Bollons, uh, the stones that they would have done the turning. And uh, was it brew women that, that um, did this? A lot of people think, yes, it was herbalists. But I tend to think that the herbalists and the alehouse brewing women were the same. And I think by the time I get to the end of the session, especially next week, I hope that becomes fairly clear. But uh, talking about these bollown stones and the women keepers of the wells, that could be an entire uh, nature folklore. And I do do water folklore stuff as well. And I did have a lovely picture of women by the well. But I'm, Oh, there they go. There's some well women. Uh, keepers of the well there. I think that's a lovely old picture of that. Anyway, thinking about these alehouse wives and alehouse women back when they were enslaved, before the things they were doing as slaves, they were making dough, baking bread, they were planting and growing herbs, um, they were planting grains, they were farming the grains, they were harvesting at first harvest, grounding them, well, threshing them, grounding them, and they boiled up all these ingredients in large black cauldrons. And the cauldrons were really, I suppose, in a way, magic spell makers. They broke away, you know, they, they understood all this stuff. They thought, well, why do I need to be enslaved on this? They developed the wisdom of the making the mash. They learned about fermentation, possibly accidentally, definitely by word of mouth for each other, and realized they had something that perhaps they could trade with. And it was a, a way they could escape from enslavement and turn the tables around. Because the one thing these women discovered is when they stirred the mash and they made the ale, and the men not only got healthy, but uh, they got merry, that somehow the men were perhaps a little bit kinder to them. I don't know what really happened, but there was definitely a turnaround where suddenly these women... They had some sort of power over the men that allowed them to break from the slavery and actually set up for themselves as alehouse women. Now, it's very gray how that happened, but that's definitely how the tradition worked. And the ancient women discovered that through their cauldrons, they could do so much to satisfy the unlimited demand of these alcoholic beverages demanded by the men, plus... Uh, if I can get up uh, 
to uh, pictures here to say it's uh, was told that beer and ale is drunk instead of water is as, as i told you is because uh settled agricultural land became hard to find clean safe water i had a picture for this i'm trying to find it for you no i haven't got that one um but it was probably the first tonic drink and as i say not really intended to create merriment and fun with but he did and the men wanted more and more and perhaps the first basics of ancient herbal medicine was to create tonic first was to create something that was safer than water get it from the wells you've got the benefit of the minerals from the water but by fermenting as we know from modern fermenting making sauerkraut uh, kimchi that type of thing great for the gut uh, protects us, all that type of thing. This was the intention of ale, and it was a great advance on tea. Now, brewing water with plants, it purifies the water, adds nutrition, and then you've got the fermentation that adds even more benefits than just making a tea. So it's a very important tool for uh, alehouse women uh, to have the cauldron, but the second perhaps important thing was the broom. There we go. There's a broom over a pub. And uh, they put these over the entrances, um, as I showed, uh, if you can remember from what we had before the uh, the house. I'm going to go and try to find the um, the shelter that I had before. Oh, no, I can't get back to that. There we go. Imagine that. I think, first of all, they might have had the broom above uh, there where it's a kind of a leather, I suppose, uh, entrance. But the huts got more sophisticated and uh, they became wooden huts eventually. And so uh, they would hang them uh, like uh, the logo for the show. They would actually hang them on the lintels uh, sticking out. And that would show they were open for business. This is an old thing. See that broom coming out? That's a more advanced hut because they went from those wicker domes. Once the men started paying them money, they could uh, afford to actually build these huts. And, of course, I'm coming up to it. When they had children, uh, the children would help. So they could build something a bit more functional uh, to be ale house women. And eventually, people could, more people could come in and have a drink. Anyway, either, uh, the, as I say, the uh, broomstick would be hanging out. Uh, it was the ale house women's symbol to let passers by the... An ale brew was ready to purchase and drink. And uh, because uh, they were by the wells, people came to the wells for their water, and they'd be invited to drink for a payment, of course. So the women there, uh, they're over business. Um, so uh, why broomstick instead of just putting up an open sign? Well, most people couldn't even read the word open, so that would have been completely useless. Uh, but if you think about it, if any of you are brew women, brew uh, people, you know that when you're in the kitchen and you're brewing stuff, you've got the leaves, you've got the stuff on the table, it's all over the place. And imagine if you've got cauldron on the fire, it's spurting everywhere with the fermenting. It's going to be one hell of a mess uh, created. Um, very messy experience, the brewing business. So I expect the alehouse women... Uh, already proud of their housekeeping skills, line their floors with rushes. And here's a, a rush floor. Uh, it might have been straw or sawdust, not necessarily the rushes, but around here rushes is uh, in uh, abundance. So that's it. Through production, they would do that. And that would hold the mess that they spilled uh, through the brewing. And then the brew, when the brew was ready, the floor was slept, swept clean, uh, ready to be nice and neat and tidy for their customers uh, who will be invited in, do their trade, buy their ale. And they, after the sweeping out, the broom was hung outside to say, I'm cleaned up, I'm ready, and I'm open and ready for business. There we go. Just like the pub's opening there as well. Uh, now, of course, it may be that the... Uh, if uh, it may be that the alehouse women put fresh straw and sawdust on the floor. And I remember uh, in uh, the pubs of Scotland and rural England, uh, 
they used to put sawdust on the floor uh, all the time, uh, certainly through the 50s and 60s. And men would actually say to their wives, I'm just taking the dog out for a walk, which really meant they were taking the dog down to the pub. And, and of course, pubs uh, in the pubs, the dogs would pee on the uh, bar floor amongst the beer that was spilled and everything else was going. So it's put into the sawdust. And if you wonder what I'm talking about, there's a pub with sawdust there. And that's what they did. And then the, the bar lady or the barman would sweep it up at the end, uh, just a great convenience. So as I mentioned, uh, these earliest ale houses, they were remote and they were by sacred uh, springs, uh, holy wells. And it seems that these ale house women, as I say, they appointed themselves as uh, well keepers. Uh, and I've shown that before. And through stories told, they would we uh, lure the uh, well visitors in purchase of ale. Now, it seems that men never bullied these women because they know that if they wrecked their brewing establishment, there was absolutely no future ale for them. It was quite an addiction. Uh, I suppose it was worse than them uh, than Facebook going off for five hours a couple of days ago. So there we go. Uh, and uh, the other thing, of course, with the brewing is uh, if uh, they messed around with the women, there'd be no more sexual favors, which was the other side business, of course from the Isaiah House women there, even in ancient Iran there, uh, as you saw that, just in case you missed it, that was uh, from thousands of years ago. So nothing changed. Uh, that was all part of the Ale House women. So I think, but in most cases, I think the merriment is from the ale and buy more ale, buy more ale. The men probably wasn't that capable at the end of the evening anyway. But to get more trade, these Ale House wives, uh, there wasn't enough passing trade from people coming to the wells because it was really mainly women that would collect the waters. Uh, at that time, they weren't that interested. Maybe they had the odd ale, of course, but this was really the men's market. So how did the ale house wives get the men to come to them when the brew was ready? What they would do, they would go off to the village or the nearest uh, small town, and they would stand in the market. And they would go there when their brew was ready. When the brew was ready, they cleared up, swept up, put the broom up. And so the stuff was ready to uh, ready to sell, ready to have customers. So how did they do that? They stood in the marketplace and they wore their black pointy hats uh, and, oh, uh, and with a mask on as well. And uh, this is, uh, I've robbed this one. That's another depiction of someone standing in the market. And they're saying with the pointy hat, uh, my brew is ready. Uh, off we go, uh, and you can come and buy my brew. Well, that was apparently early medieval time that this started up. Fifth, it was a fifth century tradition that the markets were uh, going on in some places, some sort of market anyway. And when potential customers had gathered, so off they went, followed the alehouse woman. It was a bit like a Pied Piper situation. And they followed her to the alehouse, and they would trade. Uh, with her latest cauldron wares. Now I'm going to talk about the eventual L House wife's children next. Um, but let's see what you're saying at the moment because I've blabbed on quite a bit here. Uh, some interesting things here. Little Wing used to be a pub called The Lamb in My Town that has sawdust on the floor. It's now called The Wishing Well. And its house draft is called Witch's Brew. Well, I wonder where they got their information from. And thanks for sharing that because I'm going to show an Irish situation very similar uh, in Kilkenny very soon. But it's lovely to see this somewhere else. Uh, where is that little wing? Uh, tell me where that's going on. Uh, so it's someone who looked into the pub's history and they got right back into the medieval time, didn't they? And uh, there we go. Some pubs in Scotland still have, have sawdust in the floor. I wonder why. That's excellent. Um, so that's uh, great news. Sherry is in here from, uh, she's popped in. Lovely to have you back. Everyone signing in from down East Main. Glad you came in on this weirdo time. Um, and uh, yeah, wonderful. As I say, uh, everything seems to be 
holding together a little bit. I've still got all this stuff popping up, but as I say, working with three screens, and there's all sorts of stuff. It's almost as if I've got an infection on all of them, and I'm dodging around these things. You don't see it on your screen, thank goodness, but uh, I'm having to maneuver around them and try not to click on them uh, because, as you saw what happened, they just shut me off. So anyway, uh, sorry if you see a bit of flecky in the background. I didn't manage to set up the green screen as much as I could. So enough of my excuses. Um, let's talk about the children of the alehouse women a bit. Uh, now, most of the alehouse women, they were single. And uh, different reasons why they were single. They might be single parents. Uh, children might have been born from, from husbands. Uh, they were also into some kind of slavery, and men were in slavery if they were they were sent out to sea, they were sent out to war, onto battles, and even sent into hunting groups. And that was under the orders of the chieftain, the king, maybe the abbot uh, of a monastic site, but they were under some form of slavery anyway. So, unfortunately... Uh, they got together with their wives, but under the slavery, off they were sent, and they never really saw their women at all. And unfortunately, a lot of lives, a lot of husbands were lost uh, at sea in battle, and it left single wives, and they would have children. And uh, the old house women, some of them were still married. Some of the men were still alive. They didn't get killed off in many cases, unfortunately, the men were killed off, uh, and they just got more slaves in. Uh, but, of course, some of the children from these pale housewives were born from the lusty encounters from their paying customers uh, in their their ale enterprise. So these ale housewives, uh, they have children. But the one thing about the children, they were never, ever sent to school. It would have been impossible, especially in the early medieval times. Um, there was too much to do around the cauldron. And the, so the cauldron and the kitchen, that was the schooling. That was the children's apprenticeships. That was the alehouse wives, children, the way of life. That's how they learned right from the cradle upwards. So sending children to school, if they did send them to school, well, to keep the uh, cauldron going, they would have had to employ other people to take over. One time, they hadn't got the resources for it. Um, the demand, once an ale housewife started up and serving ale, the demand actually exploded. It was an incredible business for the women to free from slavery and get into. So they needed the children as soon as possible. They didn't grow up fast enough uh, to help them out and assist them with this. So that was it. That was their apprenticeship. And the children uh, were obviously employed into endeavors as young as possible. Even It's amazing, even uh, with our children, uh, when we had a little bit of a farm in our 20s, uh, it's amazing how young we got, got the children into turf sorting and uh, tatty sewing and picking, stuff like that, or even doing little chores for the getting ready the ingredients. And that, I'm sure a lot of you might have done that. I'll still do that with children now. Anyway, the children of these ale housewives they were employed into the brewing endeavors. And of course, it wasn't all daughters. There were sons that were helping out as well. And that's a very important point I'm going to come up with. Now, for most of these ale house women, employing others was just not affordable. It's entirely family. Uh, Another point is why they didn't employ people, not because of the cost. Could they trust them? It was much easier to trust the children than it was for outsiders to come in because, uh, well, I think if you've had employees, you know what I'm talking about, employees. It was the children grew older and stronger. Their work contributions with their mother would increase, the production increased. And as the production increased, that meant growing trade, more ale was being brewed, and more customers, and eventually these women could upgrade to replace from that basic white lodge type premises I showed you earlier. Uh, they could go into a wooden hut or a lodge. Um, some of them, they built turf uh, Brick lodges, that's a great improvement in the wicker uh, dome um, that I showed earlier. 
and uh, eventually uh, some of them managed to get on to stone ones and i did have a stone picture um now the stone picture has vanished i did have a lovely stone picture anyway imagine a stone version of that i did have one but it's it's flowing away anyway larger premises you can imagine if you've got larger premises like that an alehouse woman has larger premises it meant that now it wasn't a case of uh men turning up with flagons filling them up paying the money or doing a swap with a chicken or something uh, and going away they could actually hang around socialize have a bit of crack they could drink at the bar and this if you got the men drinking at the bar then the trade was increasing uh, more and more and this was becoming much more common probably sixth century we're moving on to seventh century now uh, the transition of wealth for these alehouse women was very slow. We're talking about a thousand years. It's not like now you could set up uh, a tent, sell ale. Uh, next, uh, in three months' time, you've got a premises, you've got a pub, and then you, uh, within five years, you're a multi-millionaire with a, an international brewery. No, that didn't work like that in medieval times. Uh, but they did expand. They did uh, the, as I say, imagine this. I haven't got the stone one, but imagine if that was stone and they get more wealth in, they could add more on, they could get more wood and they could add in extension like barn style outhouses. And when they've got those, people could actually stay there and sleep. Uh, the outhouse suddenly became an inn and it's where passing travelers could come in, get their ale and they could sleep. Uh, also for the people who, the men that drank too much ale and became legless, they could sleep there too. And I'm sure uh, being by the well, uh, they got the cauldron, uh, they could perhaps have more than one cauldron area. So there's hot water, hot water baths, another trade in hot water baths for an extra fee. So there was all this enterprise growing and growing, and this was going on through the medieval age. Um now, here we go. Pendle Witches Brew, the local brewery is Phoenix Brewery. Everything is named Phoenix here. Brilliant. And you're in Haywood. Uh, well, thanks for adding that uh, little wing. I hope you're still getting reception because uh, it is evening and I, I don't get as uh, quality reception here as I do on Sunday. So I hope this is clear enough for you. I noticed from my meter that the Internet signal keeps going down, up. It's down at the moment, so I hope I'm not too echoey. Anyway, how did these ale housewives become more wealthy? Say, during 5th century medieval times, the start of the ale housewives, it was more or less a beggar culture. There they were. They went off to the market with their pointy hats and saying, I got a, a brew ready. Uh, let's go off and drink my brew uh, but they were still, you know, they were begging, uh, standing in the marketplaces, really begging, please, customers, come and try my ale, even though they weren't slaves. The thing is, because they weren't slaves, then nobody was feeding them. Nobody was sleeping them. So they, it was total begging. They, uh, uh, anyway, so their lives were very much on a fringe once they escaped from slavery. But they brewed their ales and distillations. They traded access to them. Um, through wearing their pointed hats, lured the men uh, to where the ale was, is. Children became involved. That was their apprenticeship. They became very skilled as they became older in their teens, um, who were very much skilled in the brewing craft as much as their mother, plus like teenagers, early 20s, do more ideas. You know, they became enterprising as well. So there was more brewed product, more to be distributed, more to be sold. And uh, so this did mean, um, let's see, uh, if, I got, if I missed out something here. Ah, no, I've missed uh, something. That I was going to, anyway, this is a sort of a tavern. This is where, the, you know, once they got going, this is what they got, you know, from that little uh, uh, hazel dome with some hides over it or straw. They eventually expanded to something like this. And that was the help of their family, uh, help of their children. They could get to something like this. And boy, that was that was enterprise then. And imagine what the 
men were thinking. The men thought that business was exclusive to them. And these women building up enterprises like this, hmm, they relied on these women for the ale and their, they were called ale house wives because they were like second wives, they were mistresses, concubines, all this uh, on the side. But how much of a threat was this becoming? This was a real tricky time. Um, the labors, um, the labors from the women and their families, uh, they got to these secure taverns. There was a huge security from them from the enterprise. They were well away from slavery now. Um, but um, the, it, it turned out the actual brewing perhaps was going on in an outhouse now. And that's where the children would be. So you would have the alehouse woman there. What's she doing? She is in charge of managing the premises, in charge of being the barmaid, being the woman that serves the ale, entertaining the men. She would be keeping the place clean, keeping order. Her children would be the ones in the cauldrons somewhere else brewing the ale. And this is how things expanded. This is how the family kind of expanded to themselves. So there was much more than brewing coming and going on and as the children grew older and became adults and earned the alehouse trade they learned it. it the children themselves escaped servitude there was no way they could be grabbed uh to be slaves especially the daughters this was an incredible protection for the daughters uh that had developed so the alehouse women's offspring through their successful being and protection, they would get competent and they would then want to leave their mother's brewing and the ale houses and the sons as well. They want to create their own independent lives. Now, this you would think was quite risky, but the increased revenue that they had created, there was enough cash flow to allow the support of the children to set up in brewing somewhere else. And also there was cash flow for the mothers to bring in other help. Uh, they could now pay for stuff. Whether they could be trusted or not, I don't know. But this was a celebration of trade. It was a celebration of income for these little house women. And they were starting to get wealthy. This was extremely slow. As I say, I'm talking about 15th, uh, to, uh, 5th to 15th century. But as we're coming up 8th century, 9th century, the tension of genders was starting to happen. Um, as I say, uh, their enterprise wasn't like building up a multi-million euro dollar pound enterprise within a few years. The medieval development of business was very slow. And, and of course, it was passed through the families uh, for the development. So that's how the wealth built. So several generations and descendants before, possibly before the, um, between the uh, dome, the, the, the small initial alehouse to the big tavern. So um, the growth of enterprise was um, quite a luxury. Uh, the alehouse wives really lived in luxury. But the main intent seemed to be independence from slavery, and that was more important to them than any thought of wealth. So uh, before 5th century, there's probably hardly any housewives. Uh, now, the first established church monastic communities, they settled in Ireland around the 5th century as well. And it seems the main intent of monastic communities was to establish scriptoriums. Uh, they were getting copies of the Psalms and of the Gospels. And uh, they were discovering that being able to, oh, there's more pop-up stuff. Uh, excuse me, I'm going <laughs> to control my screen here. But uh, they discovered ways of creating wealth from scribed works. It was like gold. You know, gold, wealth is based on gold. You can't do much with gold. But if you accumulate the gold, then you're regarded as wealthy. That's collateral. And that was the same as what developed with these scribed books. Uh, from the scriptoriums. It really brought prestige and positions for the ch chieftains, uh, for the chieftains who actually uh, patroned the monastic uh, abbots and abbesses to create these scriptoriums, 
to establish their wealth and position. Um, so a patriarchal culture was now developing from the 5th century based on these scriptorians. Uh, uh, so it seemed half the women at that time were enslaved, but the other half of the women also had positions with the chieftains, with the scribes, with the people connected with the upper echelons, perhaps of the farming. And you hear about the Brehon laws, and a lot of people say, oh, during the time of the Brehon laws, there was a lot of equality for women, and a lot of uh, women's movements, they will use that as a reference, you know, that we're not got equality today, uh, but they did back in the Brehon times. No, it wasn't quite like that. Only about half of the women had that protection of the Brehon laws. The other half were owned women. They were possessions. So they didn't have the rights. They didn't have those rights. So uh, I think that's something that's quite misunderstood. So anyway, we're talking about escaping from that other half of the women that didn't have rights. But these alehouse, the women that broke away, they set up the alehouse. The men kind of had a blind eye. They didn't see it as an, a threat because they were customers. They wanted the ale. They wanted the second wives, that type of thing. But the trading environment between the men and the women seemed to start changing within the sec seventh century because there was a lot of different culture shifts. I was talking with someone earlier today uh, about Oum, uh, how the Oum, and I bring this up on another uh, nature folklore. Uh, in the seventh century, the scribes started bringing in Oum symbols into their writing. Now, the Oum was really storytelling with symbols starting from the ground working upwards. But then people started using them as individual letters, like Latin letters. So from 7th century, Oum disappeared into the regular scribing. That's just one shift. Other shifts were the way that uh, church was administered, wealth was administered, scribing was now on an escalation. Um, so a lot was changing. And then by the 9th century, we're halfway through the medieval age, and the changes were increasing in speed. Now, this time, the patriarchal boys' club guilds were starting to rig up, and there we go. This was the sort of thing the men were getting together. They had the guilds. These were the boys' clubs. They were forming alliances with each other, and this was in order uh, to accumulate more wealth. How are they going to change? Uh, this was before there was any political uh, parties, uh, but if you think of the Doyle in Ireland and uh, the White House, this was the early stages, but this was localized. But this was the boys' club. They say they were connected with the church. They say it was all very Christian, but you know, they were actually forming their own intent and their own order. And this was starting up really in the ninth century, big time. And they became more and more informational. So they were developing their doctrines. Uh, they were developing their own standards of mor morality. They would read stuff out of the Bible, just like they do today. And they would decipher it into a, a morality that suited themselves, a patriarchal morality. You know how that's been going on. And uh, they would always claim, the, the men would claim, the, the morality they were setting up. It was there, right there in the scriptures, of course, that you can t open up the Bible at any point of the scriptures. You can take a line. Boy, and put that into a morality. That's the sort of thing I think was uh, going on. And at that time, even 9th century, most of the people, they couldn't read uh, scriptures or Bibles anyway. So how would they you know any different? Um, so uh, they could be told anything, a bit like politicians, I suppose, today, because the people couldn't read. They could read pictures. They could read symbols. But these uh, boys' clubs, they were the gatekeepers of the scripts. Uh, and uh, this was why these uh, the demand was for out of these scriptoriums, make these manuscripts, make these books, because this enabled the boys' clubs to get bigger, allowed them to form. It was their uh, mascots. Their, it's what held them together. They would have the big black book or the red book, and that was what they claimed was their authenticity. And this is what was developing. And this was accelerating halfway through the medieval period, 9th century. And uh, But then the women's taverns were getting bigger. They were hosting more people. There was more overnight in-services. And uh, 
in England, there's some pubs that started with this heritage, uh, uh, as uh, was kindly pointed out uh, by Little Wing there, that uh, she gave us the Wishing Well pub. So I'm going to give you a few examples of England, and then I'm going over to uh, Ireland. There's the Ferry Boat Inn. There we go. There's a Ferry Boat Inn. Uh, that's 6th century origin, that place. Uh, that's by the River Cam in Cambridgeshire. Um, it's just, you know, I'm setting the imagination. Imagine the ale housewives on that, that side. They're by water. River Cam. Uh, very important for navigation at the time. And then we got the old fighting cock in St. Albans. Appropriate name, I suppose. Uh, that's an 8th century um, that's got its 8th century origin. And some of that building is from uh, the 8th century as well. Um, so that's Norman. And then there's a porch house in Cheltenham. Uh, this is 10th century, so we're moving on. Uh, no, it's not coming up. There's porch house. That's 10th century. That's in Cheltenham. Uh, one that I've been to and familiar with, it's also 10th century, is the Bingley Arms, and this is in Leeds. Uh, so there's that one there. Now, uh, th there's none in Scotland that I'm aware of. Maybe you can come up with. Well, there is one in Wales, the Skerris. Uh, oh, I, I got the name wrong. Skerrit. There we go, the Skerrit. Uh, that's north of Abergavenny. That's 11th century. Uh, and that was definitely women. It's got an incredible history uh, of women, the Vale House women there. And they were thrown out... Uh, uh, by men uh, by the 16th century. And when the men took it over, uh, it uh, became a courthouse. And this was another thing that was happening as well, that when men started trying to take over from the 9th century, they tried to find reasons to take over. And sometimes the sons, unfortunately, the sons of the family of the alehouse women, they didn't want to be isolated from the rest of the men. So they would become part of the boys' clubs and they would be instrumental in throwing their own mothers out. And they, these weren't only alehouses, but they became courthouses that were a huge affliction on their mothers. Uh, and so, the, you know, we're really getting to the hot stuff now, aren't we? Now, in Ireland, we've got the Shane. Oh, this is very famous. A lovely place to go to. There's Sean's by and Athlone. A lovely place to visit even today. That's, century, uh, that's 10th century. And even Boy George owned that one for a while. Beautiful pub to visit. It's a quiet place. Uh, worth going if you're in Athlone. Now, this is where we get to some serious story. There's this one in um, Kilkenny. You might know the story. This is a famous witch story here. Ah, I can't. I'm running over time. Anyway, I'm moving along. Uh, this, actually, this was uh, not an alehouse woman, woman that was necessarily in slavery. She was the daughter of an immigrant Norman banker. And she, uh, Alice has her name, and she, uh, uh, yes, uh, Alice, uh, she opened up her alehouse, uh, Alice uh, Kaitella. She opened up the alehouse in 1263, but very quickly she was accused of witchcraft, and sadly uh, she got, um, now I'm trying to find, uh, this is inside the Kaitellas. There we go. And uh, excuse me. I'm, uh, get a, oh, boy. Um, trying to get pictures up here for you. Uh, most of the pictures I had. Anyway, here's inside the pub. There's uh, there's Alice anyway. Oh, there she's gone. There's Alice. Uh, that's in, uh, a model of her inside the pub with her broomstick, of course, for clearing out. Uh, but she was, uh, as I say, she's. She was accused of witchcraft, and uh, not only was she accused of witchcraft, uh, there's an accusation, there she is, that's uh, caught supposedly inside a pub somewhere, uh, inside a bar, that's where her picture of her being accused, and sadly, she was the first ever alehouse woman to be burned at the stake as a witch. Um, in uh, the 3rd of November, 1324, first woman to be burned at the stake. And this was actually before any woman was burned, before any house woman was burned in what's now Britain. 
So she was the first. Although Germany had been burning them, unfortunately, for a while. Oh dear, I've got more, uh, more challenges going on here. Uh, excuse me, I am getting near the end. One of my, one of my uh, computers is packing up here. Anyway, Alice was found guilty. Uh, uh, the things that she was charged with. Let's bring Alice back up again. Uh, the things she was charged with, uh, there's uh, accusations. Uh, she was charged with cutting up animals and placing their meat for the devil to pick up at crossroads. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, she had a lover. Um, it said her lover was Robert or Robin Artisan, who was believed to be the son of the devil. And there's her meeting up, an artist's impression of her meeting up with Robin Artisan. And um, and worst of all, she was accused of making evil love potions to corrupt the purity of Christians. Yes, right, making love potions to corrupt the purity of Christians. That was the third thing that she was accused of. Now, W. B. Yeats actually included Yeats in a poem, and I'm going to see if I can get this out for you. No, I won't do it in the Yeats uh, voice, or will I? 1900 and 19 comes to mind. There lurches past the great eyes without thought. Under the shadow of straw pale locks, that insolent fiend Robert Allison, to whom love torn Lady Kaitello brought. Bronze peacock feathers and red combs of her cocks. Now, there's also a movie that's been scripted and acted by Ashley Judd about the story of Lady Alice. It's called The Burning Time. But unfortunately, the release has been delayed and delayed and delayed for 15 years. But there's a rumor that it's actually finally going to come out next year. So it seems there was fear uh, that uh, had increased amongst men regarding the women starting 9th century, really escalated from the 11th century because they regarded these women as challenging the turfs of their wealth. And it does seem the wealthy area house women attempted to form business alliances with these men to help them increase their wealth. Okay, come and be a partner with me instead of objecting. Come on, let's share this wealth together. They tried that out. But because they were so tightly ingrained with this church and this invented church morality and the gilded boys clubs, they had their order and their, they were becoming ingrained into this morality, this purity ma morality that was to then carry on for several hundred years after the medieval times. Uh, so the, me the female alliances were very few. They wanted to take over the women's enterprises. They wanted the men to have the domain of the, the pubs, the breweries. They wanted that to be the courthouse. And this is what seemed to finally broke out, break out into the life of Alice Kaitella there. Uh, she became a very wealthy alehouse wife, but the alliances she forged turned on her. And this was the start of the populist propaganda by these boys clubs to turn the local communities on them. The local communities relied on them, these people, as medicine women, as healing their ailments. The ale was medicine. Uh, the holy wells that they were keepers of were medicine. So these were like goddesses of rural Ireland. But these boys club people, they were bringing out these stories of witchcraft, fear monger them, that they were dabbling with the devil. And this was horrific. And they turned the pop, you know, through popularist fear mongering, the local people turned on these alehouse women that they revered and suddenly they were the devil's enemy. And this was really how witchcraft or the whole imagery and story of witchcraft was coming about. Um, and so these church-based guilds were the first men alliances to overcome the spread of alehouse culture expansion. They wanted the breweries for themselves. That was basically it. They felt the men had the right to all wealth. So this propaganda of witchcraft was there to bring that to them. And I think uh, I'll recap that a bit before 
I'll move on. Uh, so women have discovered they could commercialize their skills. Uh, they've been born into servitude uh, and slavery. They use their skills of housekeeping, kitchen duties, farming, especially of barley, cereals, and apples too. The women discovered that they converted skills into brewing and even lustful services. That enabled them to build up wealth and position, especially with the help of children that came along that were born to them. And aside from being ale housewives, their sons shared the brewing with their mothers, developed equal brewing skills. But as male brewers ended up linking with these male guilds and turning on their mothers as well. Uh, so ale housewives' sons, they probably had a huge burden with loyalties. Must have been painful because they had the loyalty to the mothers, loyalty to the leagues of men. Uh, so that's the recap. Um, so no doubt brewing was starting to define human power through at least all of through human history, brewing defined power, really. Um, so throughout the world, the brewing was, the, it started in ancient times from Persia, defying a tribe, and then now it was defying a nation. But I like to quote I heard somewhere from someone in the last couple of days how a nation is, or nationalism, is just pure fiction. Anyway, I'm going to talk about brewing and nationalism in the third part next Wednesday um, because the people who handed out the people's mugs, their ale mugs, they are the people responsible for the brewing enterprises, but they're also the same people who operate the levers of power over people. And this is why the Ale House Wives were so major, uh, powerful, and why that power was seized from them, because they ruled the nation's culture. And again, my, my father, I brought this up in uh, other nature folklore, my father frequently used to remind me, nobody gets anything done or get any cooperation from other people until they buy the other person a drink. Though my father, uh, he set up a nation, well, no, not a nation, I'm getting tired now. Though my father set up a network of healing circles, my father had another life, he was a fixer. And what he did, he arranged things, uh, he arranged to get things done as favors. And that's what he meant by buying the other person a drink. That was his philosophy. Today, we're just calling it pushing brown envelopes, don't we? Well, the uh, ale house wives, uh, when the men pay for ale um, and the lusty pleasures opened up for them, were they ever sober enough to experience this? Anyway, I skimmed through quite a bit through part two. That was a thousand years of medieval. I hope it made sense. Uh, establishing the medieval ways from 5th century through to the 15th century. The ale house women slowly earning reverend status position, but sadly now starting to decline from the Christian conversion and takeover. Uh, the, their culture was restructuring. And from, feudalism was appearing in, between the 12th and 14th century at the end, last 200 years of the medieval time. Normans were in, they'd been invited in, Feudalism was starting up. And uh, I'm going to cover uh, in the next series, um, the concluding series, uh, B7 p.m. Uh, on next Wednesday. And I'm going to be covering the effects of this tougher doctrine from these boys' club upon the Yale House women during these feudalism years. And also how an incredibly wise, intelligent German nun, you might be familiar with her, St. Hildegard of Bingen, she changed the whole brewing landscape for the alehouse women, the uh, escape yet again. Because after the 12th century, it became very difficult and life-threatening for many women to carry on brewing as they had done uh, in the past thousand or 800 years. So they changed tack for the next 400 years. And... I'll also explain more about how alehouse women became branded as witches and how persecution was turned on them and how their families became persecuted as well. 
but alehouse women were resilient many were resilient and all through the that um the brewing industry carried on there were alehouse women and during the last 300 years though brewing and alehouses have been more associated with men through europe through uh, the uk through ireland it's regarded as a men's business imagine ireland without guinness you know i was saying about how brewing really controls the power of a nation how much does guinness rule the imagery of ireland there's a good example but i'll carry on with more about the origins of witchy symbols such as more about brooms hats cats very important one cauldrons and spells and i wasn't going to carry the ancient about the ancient full of flour ancient cooking areas and I'm going to talk about their possible, well, probable links to these alehouse women. And then I'm going to move over to our present, where the alehouse women traditions are now regrowing, especially in South America, in those countries, African countries. The old, the alehouse tradition is growing like it did with the alehouse women in the north. They're becoming like goddesses of South America and parts of Africa. And then I'm going to close up the part three with ideas of how women today might be able to identify themselves with the, the good things I've been talking about and how they can interpret witches for now. Because there's a lot of women, they're very proud to say, oh, I'm a witch. Why are they proud of that? I'm going to go into that a bit. And I'm going to be talking more about the healing and care practices of people who call themselves witches what they're doing and what the origins of that is and why it's connected to the alehouse brewing. So I think that I've uh, gone well over uh, with that. Uh, and uh, next uh, Saturday, uh, next Sunday, uh, what are we doing? Next Sunday is uh, Nature Folklore. Do I have pictures? No, I should have pictures. We've got the uh, Sunday back on the schedule, uh, which is Fire Dragons and Serpents. Uh, that's next Sunday, and uh, that's 10th of October. And then, of course, the 13th of October, the next Wednesday, I'll do the finale of this Witches, Cauldrons, and Ale. 17th of October, it's the Crows, Ravens, and other Covids. Uh, did I get that wrong? I said that wrong, didn't I? Uh, ravens, Crows, Ravens, and Corvids. Oh, dear, that's bad. That's very bad. 24th of October, I go into the Sawan Origins Part 1. Then we, that'll be Owen Agat and Emma the Mucker uh, up in Ulster. And then 31st of October, Part 2 of Sawan Origins with Talaka, Hills of Talaka and Tara. And then we'll have the traditions gathering with your poetry and stories on the real Sawan date of 7th of November, some 7th of and, September, uh, 7th of November. So please submit your Sawan poems and short stories for that to me. Uh, let's see what you're saying uh, as I try to close this up now. Um, I'm going to close the uh, this up here. Uh, yeah, there's, uh, there's a picture of Inside Owen again. We're going to talk about that. And um, Elise was asking, let's see what you're asking. Going to ask the exact question you've just answered. Did the burning coincide with women becoming powerful and independent? Of course it did. The whole burning was a front. I hope I put, uh, made that clear. I'm going to talk about that next Wednesday in great detail uh, because it was a very cruel time. It's very difficult to actually um, talk about this because uh, there's so much good thing and so many good things that happened for women under the alehouse traditions and it is reviving big time but i think this is what the whole series is about there's an imagery by people who call themselves witches that it was all about herbalism and the herbalism is talked about in a very airy fairy way they have there's a lot of women they kind of dress up and they they have these beautiful youtube channels of how everything's love peace and witchery herbery and so forth so I'm linking this because witchery, as we call it today, is I think the history of women is so tied up around these alehouse wives. And it goes right back, as I showed, to Mesopotamia thousands of years ago, where even a poem there translated alehouse wives. They were the second house of women, 
Uh, they were like the goddesses to men. And I could go into a part four, really, and uh, but we cover it in other subjects of um, where we talk about the social network underground uh, in forests and what goes on there. And then when the trees are above ground, they're fighting for the lights, so that, and like the yin-yang in the dark, the cold, uh, feminine, and then uh, yang in the heat, the light, and the male. So there's that going on in this association, I think, with this whole church-linked boys club. You can look, you know, churches, spires, towers, stuff sticking up. What have the women got? They've got cauldrons in a circle. They have the five-pointed star to show that they've got a quality brew. Even that yin-yang sy uh, symbolism that we get in the forest of the roots uh, and the fungi together, but the trees sticking up, that comes in with this whole boys' club connected with the church to me and the symbolism of the cauldron. It's amazing how all this stuff, by to me, the imagery sort of ties in together. So very complicated, and I'm finding it hard to keep it simple, but that's the imagery I'm working around. Uh, fascinating. Um, then we got, hello, John, nice to catch up the end of this video, real work from beginning. Hope it makes sense because I threw this together really quickly. I hope it's clear enough because this signal has been going up and down really badly. I work with three screens to do these productions, and they've all been playing up. Um, one of them's gone dead now anyway. Uh, but I don't need it anymore. So, and and stuff's been dancing around. I don't know what though. Messages from other software things. I don't know. Uh, maybe I'm being hacked by the Facebook people. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, uh, as a good show is coming up. Says Terry Slack. Thanks very much. Um, fascinating. I think we. I think I'm gonna kind of call it an evening. I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, watching this uh you can watch the archive video uh it does keep running i forgive i do uh, if you're watching the archive all this stuff dancing around on the screen cut me off for a couple of minutes but we got i came back it was near the beginning so excuse that i haven't gone away uh i did manage to get back and we carried on um so uh have a safe few days. I'm going to be back with you Sunday, hopefully more organized because I don't have too much to uh, prepare for the Sunday uh, with the fire dragons and serpents. I love doing that edition as well. And so that's another of our one collection. So until Sunday, uh, let's see. I better get back to my pictures again and at least try and be a li little bit more professional with the uh, saying bye-bye. Uh, Hey, well, be inspired. Thank you very much for your patience in uh, putting up with me this evening and from different parts of the world. And I'm trying to organize this out. Thank you very much. And thank you, Sherry, as well. Interesting. Thanks so much as well. So it's that's it. That's all I've got for this. So bye, -bye and see you on Sunday and also next Wednesday. Bye. Bye.